Good afternoon. My name is Tom Sheridan. I'm the Assistant Director for Student Life for the University of Colorado, Denver. And I'd like to welcome you to our second event in this week's uh, series, The Anatomy of War. Uh, just really quickly, the purpose of this series was to bring the war on terror in general back to uh, the forefront. Um, in the literature that we put out for this event, we pointed out that October 7th actually marks the seventh anniversary of the beginning of combat operations for the War on Terror. Uh, that's when we started out uh, in Afghanistan. So we felt that this week would be an appropriate week to explore the war again and to try to present our campus community and the community at large with as many perspectives on this war as we possibly can. We're such a bitterly divided nation, that, uh, and particularly in an election cycle, that uh, we felt that it would be very important for us to present um, you know, a broad perspective of the war. Um, included in some of these events, uh, obviously today's guest, Mr. Fyth. Um, Thursday is Howard Zen. Uh, yesterday we had Lorna Teicherstoop, who's an independent journalist, speak on her experiences in Iraq. Uh, she has a, a very interesting story. Uh, we have students who are going to be speaking tomorrow uh, with their experiences uh, in combat. Uh, the lecture, the panel is kind of, it's titled, uh, Women in 21st Century Combat. So they'll be talking about their experiences uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan and in the military. Uh, the, our veteran services uh, will be here tomorrow as well, a, a town hall style meeting. Um, Senator Gary Hart will be speaking on national security in the 21st century. And the ACLU Colorado and the Independence Institute from Golden will be here to do, discuss the Patriot Act. Uh, so you know, this whole week was kind of designed to like I said, provide this really broad perspective on the war itself, not just focusing on Iraq or Afghanistan, but just to revisit this issue since, uh, you know, I think in my press release we had mentioned something, you know, the left and the right bludgeoning each other in the media. Um, that's something that we really wanted to avoid. You know, we're trying to avoid uh, any kind of partisanship. We just need perspective. So uh, without further ado, Douglas Fyth, Under Secretary of Defense, uh, working in from 2001, I'm sorry, to 2005. 2005, uh, responsible for our foreign policy uh, within the George Bush administration, and he's going to share with us uh, his experiences. And he wrote a wonderful book, which unfortunately we don't have today, but we will have in the library soon, or the, rather the bookstore soon. Uh, War and Decision. Um, so I'm going to get off the stage and let Mr. Fyth share his experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's good to have this opportunity to, to talk with you, and uh, I hope we can generate the kind of uh, civil discussion that, that Tom referred to. Uh, the newspapers today are, of course, reporting trillion-dollar losses in our banking system, so some of you may have uh, crisis overload, um, which might make it hard to to cast your mind back. But what I'd like to do is to have us all kind of cast our mind back some years to, to another crisis, uh, and specifically to recall the 9-11 attack. Now, anybody here who is a, a first-year student or sophomore would have been in elementary school probably in September 2001. So 9-11 may seem like a bygone era to you. It may seem to have little connection to your lives now, but the, the bloody destruction of the World Trade Center and the, the attack on the Pentagon and the, and the fatal attempt to crash the, that fourth plane uh, into some other important target were part of a problem that persists today, and it affects all of our lives, uh, not only if you've lost a loved one among the, the 3,000 people murdered, and not only uh, in, in the general sense that our country is fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also on the micro level. 9-11 and the Islamist extremism problem can affect who's going to be your roommate in college. The government continues to restrict visas for foreign students. It can affect your decisions about what you post on uh, Facebook or send uh, in an email because 9-11 caused the government to increase monitoring of the Internet and to make trade-offs between privacy interests and public safety. When you're headed 
perhaps home this Thanksgiving and you're standing in, in a long security line at the airport as people are pulling off their belts and shoes, you can think of other ways that the terrorism problem continues to make life less free and, and more risky uh, for, for all of us, even at the personal level. Now, what I'd like to do today is, is to revisit what was the most uh, interesting and important deliberation that I participated in as, as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the Pentagon. Um, and that was the President's decision on how to respond to the 9-11 attacks. I also want to discuss how the President's strategy after 9-11 led to the decision to remove Saddam Hussein from power, even though Saddam uh, was not, as far as we know, involved in the 9-11 attack. Now, I'm going to keep my opening remarks focused on the history that my book, uh, War and Decision, deals with. But when we get to the Q's and A's, I'll be happy to take uh, your questions and comments about current events. Before 9-11, the United States responded to terrorist attacks chiefly by sending out the FBI uh, to identify and locate individuals who could be arrested and prosecuted. The focus was on punishment and retaliation. After 9-11, President Bush and his national security team had to decide what to do in response. Now, all kinds of decisions look inevitable in retrospect, but it was not at all obvious what our response should be. Top officials in the, in the State Department and in the CIA proposed actions in line with the traditional U.S. practice. Find out who did it and retaliate against them. And there's, of course, an obvious logic in the, in the impulse to punish wrongdoers. But other administration officials, including President Bush, believed that that was not an adequate response to the attack on New York and Washington. In the days after 9-11, some officials immediately proposed courses of action. And Secretary Rumsfeld said that we couldn't evaluate one proposed course of action against another until we were clear on our national goals, the purpose for which the actions are, uh, the, the purpose that our actions are supposed to serve. He had a, a a standard way of ridiculing people who advocated action without first defining their strategic aims. He said, if, if you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. And so all these discussions of the different paths in front of us are not really strategically useful until we've identified clearly and agreed as a government on what our strategic purposes are. Now, I believe it's to his credit, President Bush started not by picking a course of action, but by setting a strategic goal. He decided that the aim of our country's actions in response to 9-11 should be to prevent the next major terrorist attack against the United States. Now, no U.S. president had ever before responded to terrorism by setting such an ambitious goal. It's really hard to overstate how radical and how significant that decision was. An enormous amount flowed from it. It shaped our strategy in Afghanistan, in the counterterrorism actions that we took all around the world, and in the war in Iraq. Now, I believe we developed a, a proper apprehension of the threat and a good strategy. Uh, Mark Twain made famous a, uh, a quip about the composer Richard Wagner to the effect that Wagner's music is better than it sounds. And uh, along similar lines, my thesis is that the president's strategy against terrorism is better than it sounds. That is, the administration has done a better job fighting